In the next three lessons, um, we want to study the notion of evaluating fairness in electoral districting. So we've talked previously about the question of fairness, what makes something fair, and can we use mathematics to evaluate fairness? In this lesson, we want to talk about the issue of fairness as it relates to electoral districting and something called gerrymandering. So we're going to start with just a little bit of political background. Electoral districting is the process of creating geographic subdivisions within an electoral unit, such as a country, a state, or even a city, for conducting elections for representation to a legislative body like the United States Congress, a state legislature, or just a city council. So representatives to the legislature are chosen to represent the interests of voters that elected them to office, and their re-election is presumably contingent upon successful representation of those interests as judged by the voters in subsequent elections. Now states establish the process for drawing statewide electoral districts. And in a majority of states, the process is retained by the legislature. So state legislatures, and in some cases there's a role for the governor, they draw state legislative boundaries. And in other states, a commission draws the districts. So what are some things that might be considered when drawing these districts so that the end result is fair? Well, currently there are five values that figure into drawing district lines. Equal representation, contiguity, compactness, electoral competition, and maintaining communities of interest. So the goal of this video is to explore those five, uh, those five values and kind of give you an idea of what they each mean. So we'll start with equal representation. In 1963, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that state legislative districts must contain equal numbers of people, establishing the principle of one person, one vote. So prior to this decision, for instance, the California State Senate was composed of 40 members representing its 58 counties. And as a result, the one senator from Los Angeles County represented 6 million voters, while a senator from a set of rural counties represented fewer than 15,000 voters. So therefore, a vote in L.A. County was, was worth less than a vote in a smaller rural district. Currently, within a state, every congressional district has the same population so far as can be determined by census data. All right, the next two um, values on our list are something called contiguity and compactness. Now, 49 states require that districts be contiguous. And contiguous just means that these districts are path connected with the exception of geographical features like islands. So otherwise, you should be able to drive from one part of the district to the other, um, to every other aspect of the district um, without there being like, without separating the district into space pieces. 23 states require that districts are compact. Now definitions of compactness vary by state, but basically it means that the shapes of the electoral districts shouldn't be too stretched out and the boundaries shouldn't be too jagged. And our second video on the topic of electoral districting is going to focus entirely on this notion of compactness. Okay, so we've discussed equal representation, contiguity, and compactness. Fourth on our list is electoral competition. So district lines can be drawn to increase the likelihood of a particular electoral outcome by packing voters with similar interests into a district to diminish their voting power outside of that district, or cracking similar voters into different districts to dilute their influence in any particular district election. And this is referred to as a gerrymander. So gerrymandered districts are intended to reduce the competition in a single district. And let's look at a couple of really famous districts that currently exist in the nation um, that are kind of known as two of the worst gerrymandered districts in the country. The first is Illinois' fourth district. So two neighborhoods 
areas that are not connected at all have been merged together using a thin sliver of highway. The neighborhood to the north is primarily Puerto Rican and the one to the south is primarily Mexican American. So they've taken um, these two neighborhoods and just kind of um, forced them into a single district and this is the poorest district in the state of Illinois. Um, another example is Ohio's 11th district. Lawmakers in Ohio connected the cities of Akron and Cleveland. And so 40% of this district's population is black. And combining the black communities from two different cities was a way of diminishing their political power in either city. So again, these are two of kind of the worst gerrymandered districts in the country currently. Um, this, note, this idea of gerrymandering was in the news uh, recently, uh, in a 5-4 decision along traditional conservative liberal ideological lines, the Supreme Court ruled that partisan redistricting is a political question not reviewable by federal courts and that those courts can't judge if extreme gerrymandering violates the Constitution. So the ruling essentially put the onus on the legislative branch and on individual states to police redistricting efforts. All right, our last um, value that we can might want to consider when thinking about electoral districting is the notion of communities of interest. So um, contiguous and compact districts are often considered sufficient to maintain the integrity of interest representation, but shared interests don't always conform to geography. For example, in the 1980s, the Reagan Justice Department began to push for the creation of majority minority districts in states with a history of racial discrimination. So these districts would be comprised of a majority of minority voters to help incorporate the interests of minority voters. So to make sure that these um, these minority voters would always have um, a representative, someone representing their district um, at the legislative body. It can be hard um, to kind of understand the difference between electoral competition versus communities of interest. So hopefully this next example will help. Um, when we talk about electoral competition, there we're really thinking about political parties, Democrats, Republicans, and independents. Whereas communities of interest could just be a particular um, um, particular topic, um, something that they that a group of people care deeply about. Um, so suppose each rectangle here represents um, a neighborhood of 10 people. The fact that they all are labeled with D means that each one of these neighborhoods are typically Democratic neighborhoods, Democratic families. Um, but the star on certain rectangles um, represents that, that these particular neighborhoods care about a particular interest. Maybe it's something involving schools. Maybe they're going to raise taxes um, to help pay for something with schools. Um, and so these these stars maybe represent neighborhoods that tend to have small children, and so they're going to care deeply about these issues. And the neighborhoods without stars are generally um, older communities who just don't have as much interest um, in that particular issue. So we want to um, divide these neighborhoods up into three into three districts. So one way to do it would be to be do, to do something like this. So notice that the orange neighborhood in the middle has no one who cares about this particular interest. So whoever they elect to represent them, that person is likely not going to care. Um, but in blue and green, they're about half and half. So there's a good chance that they're going to be able to elect someone um, to represent the blue district and the green district who do care about whatever the particular issue is. Two thirds um, of those elected um, are likely going to vote toward this particular item of interest. Um, we could also um, divide them like this. And in this case, notice now in the green district, it's still about 50-50. So there's still a good chance that they'll be able to elect someone who cares about this particular issue um, to the legislative body. But in both blue and orange now, um, only one-fourth um, of those districts care about this issue. And so it's unlikely that they'll be able to send um, a representative to, to the legislative body to to speak on their behalf. Um, so here's just uh, hopefully gives you some indication of how notice in either districting everyone is a Democrat so the electoral competition looks the same regardless of how the districting has been done um, but the the interest um, is different um, 
in the two di in the two districting options. Okay, so what do you think? Um, for congressional districts, each district must have the same number of people residing in the district. That's that equal competition that we talked about first. Is this important to your concept of fairness in districting or is it unimportant? Why? Of the values discussed, equal representation, contiguity, compactness, electoral competition, and maintaining communities of interest, which of these concepts of fairness are important to you? And why? Something to think about. Now, any particular districting plan may require trade-offs between the values we've discussed. So compact and continuous districts do not ensure competition or automatically maintain communities of interest. Promoting competition and interest may mean creating districts that are not compact. So mathematics can shed light on which of these values is maximized and which are minimized, even though it cannot answer the question of which values are more important to maximize. Great, so this is our introduction to the topic of electoral districting. In our next video, we're going to look at the mathematics behind the notion of compactness. And then our third video, um, we'll talk about more about political power. Thanks so much. I'll see you then.